In October of 2005, ATI released their first R500 based graphics card, the Radeon X1800 XT. It was positioned to counter NVIDIA's new G70 based 7800 GTX, and while in the end it was trading blows with the NVIDIA card, it was priced a bit too high to compete. However, just three months later in January of 2006, ATI pushed the R500 architecture to its limits with the very powerful Radeon X1900 XTX. As usual, we'll start off with the card's specifications. It's using the R580 GPU which has an amazing 48 pixel shaders along with 8 vertex shaders, 16 TMUs, 16 ROPs, and is clocked at a fast 650 MHz. Its VRM configuration consists of 512MB of GDDR3 clocked at 775MHz and is running on a 256-bit bus making for a total memory bandwidth of 50GB per second. As to be expected for a 16-year-old graphics card, we have pretty much no modern API support, with the card supporting up to DirectX 9C and OpenGL 2.1. The card is a TDP of 135 watts, which doesn't sound like a lot now, but back then this was quite a lot of power for a graphics card. Architecturally, the R580 GPU is pretty much identical to the previous R520 found in the X1800 XT. However, for R580, ATI massively scaled up their pixel shader engine by tripling the amount of pixel shader cores, which brought the pixel shader count up to 48 from 16 on R520. ATI believed a 3 to 1 ratio of pixel shaders to TMUs and ROPs would yield an ideal balance for future 3D applications, and this is evident in some of their other cards of the era like the Radeon X1600 series. Anyway, the X1900 series was released to compete with Nvidia's high-end G70 cards, specifically the 7800 GTX 512MB. And this it did fairly well, as the X1900 XT offered 5-10% more performance than the 7800 GTX 512 at the same price. Nvidia shot back with their die shrunk and highly overclocked 7900 GTX, which did give the X1900 cards a run for their money in games of the time. It was in later games, however, where the X1900 cards showed their advantage, as thanks to having more brute force shading power, they pulled far ahead all of Nvidia's 7000 series cards in later and more complex games. This was worsened by G70's architectural limitations, which further held back their already limited pixel shading performance. I would go into detail here, but that story really deserves its own video. So where did the X1900 XTX fit in here? Well, it was pretty much just a binned and overclocked X1900 XT. Even so, clocks were not much higher than the standard XT, as core frequencies were only increased by a meager 4% along with a similarly underwhelming 7% increase to memory frequencies. And at $100 more than the regular XT, the XTX was a pretty bad card when it came to price to performance. However, value wasn't really the point of the XTX, as it was aimed more at ATI enthusiasts looking for the absolute best card they had to offer. Well, that pretty much wraps up this card's history, so let's talk more about the card itself. I purchased this card online for $35, and it was kept in pretty good shape by the previous owner. I've actually fitted an old Universal Zalman cooler onto this card, which I sourced from a cheap Radeon HD 4850 that I got for 15 bucks. These older aftermarket GPU coolers are becoming harder and harder to find, so I'm lucky to have gotten one for so cheap. On the topic of thermals, they're pretty poor here. The X1900 series cards were notorious for being absolute furnaces, and my card is definitely no exception as even after changing the thermal paste on the stock cooler, the card would often get beyond 95 degrees C under load, which is pretty insane. It goes without saying that custom AIB cooling solutions or aftermarket coolers are preference since the stock cooler has so much trouble handling the heat output. Also, I thought it was worth mentioning that even with this Zalman cooler, the GPU still hits around 80 degrees C under full load. As much as I would have loved to show some overclock results today, unfortunately I just couldn't get any overclock working on this card. I tried using all of the older overclocking tools like ATI Tool, Riva Tuner, and ATI Tray Tools, but the card would keep crashing no matter what voltage or settings I chose. I even tried loading up Windows XP, but it didn't really help as the card would still not respond well to any overclock. I'd like to figure out what I'm doing wrong here, but this video has taken long enough to make already, so I decided to leave it be for now. Anyway, let's get into some benchmarks. For today's testing, we'll be using my older testbed, and its specs are on screen now. All footage was captured on an external device, so there's no hit to gaming performance. Let's see how this powerhouse from early 2006 holds up in some games. Our first game up is Tomb Raider, and I used the built-in benchmark with a 720p resolution and the low settings. We got averages of 45fps, with 1% lows down to 26. 
it looked a bit worse than the 7th generation console ports of the game while running slightly better. I was pretty impressed by the results here, and overall this game was a good showing of what this card can do thanks to its pixel shading capability. Next game is Mountain Blade Warband, and at 1080p with the medium settings and 2xAA, we got averages of 43 FPS, with 1% lows down to 30. Frame times were good and the game looked nice thanks to the 1080p resolution. This is one of the less demanding titles from the early 2010s, but the results were still a pleasant surprise given the higher resolution and settings. Next up is Minecraft 1.16.5, as it's the latest version of the game to support OpenGL 2.1. Anyway, here I used Optifine in the 1080p resolution along with the fancy settings. The card got averages of 88 FPS, with 1% lows down to 58. Our frame times were very good here, which is surprising for Minecraft. There was an odd visual glitch with clouds or foliage in the distance, but I found it to be very minor and not bothersome at all. Terraria is up next, and with the 1080p resolution and the high preset with color lighting enabled, we got averages of 60 FPS, with 1% lows down to 57. Frame times were excellent and the game looked great at 1080p as well. Overall, the X1900 XTX yielded a butter smooth experience with this game. Next up is Half-Life 2, and with the 1080p resolution and the high settings with 4xAA, the card managed averages of 64 FPS, with 1% lows down to 40. The game looked great and ran well too, which made for a very pleasant experience all in all. As to be expected, the game could drop frames when a lot of effects were on screen, but even when this did happen, it barely impacted playability. Next game up is Sniper Ghost Warrior 2, and with a 720p resolution and the low settings, we got averages of 41 FPS, with 1% lows down to 32. Frame times were good, and I'll say, I was definitely not expecting the game to be playable at these settings. This was another great example of what the X1900 XTX can pull off in some newer games. If you drop the resolution to 800x600, you could see closer to 60fps, but I wasn't too bothered by the lower frame rates as it is a slower paced game. Our last game for today is Counter Strike Source, as I was having some issues with CSGO on this card. Anyhow, I used the built-in benchmark with the 1080p resolution and the low settings, and the card got averages of 212 FPS, with 1% lows down to 116. Our frame times were excellent, with the card providing a very competitive experience. The visual fidelity offered at 1080p was also pretty nice. To conclude, the Radeon X1900 XTX really surprised me. Thanks to its incredible pixel shading power, the card can power through games released years after it, which can make for some very surprising scenarios like with Tomb Raider and Sniper Ghost Warrior 2. It's not hard to see why the X1900 series are regarded as some of the fastest single GPU DX9 cards ever made, especially considering a lot of Nvidia's 7000 series cards fall flat on their faces in more modern titles. Anyhow, that'll be it for this video. Thank you all for watching! Like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one.